Welcome everyone to another week in motorsport. Today, Motorsports Features Editor Rob Widows and myself will be discussing the Bahrain Grand Prix, CFD and also Nick Worth leaving Virgin Racing. Rob, the FIA has announced that the Bahrain Grand Prix will be held and it's going to be held on October the 30th, which is when the Indian Grand Prix was scheduled to happen. I think that's now going to move to December, either the 3rd or the 11th. But both Mark Webber and Rubens Barrichello have expressed concerns about it. And our editor, Damien Smith, said on Twitter, I'll read, read here, Motorsport calls on photo to boycott the Bahrain Grand Prix. Rescheduling this race is an outrage. It must not take place. Bearing in mind we don't want to get sued, what are your thoughts? Well, hello everybody. Hello, Ed. Um, my thoughts on the Bahrain. Uh, I think that the FIA has made a mistake. I can't figure out why they don't seem to see that. I'm not altogether surprised that Bernie Ecclestone supports it, because Bernie has often said that he doesn't think either religion or politics uh, should get in the way of motor racing but they have got in the way of motor racing, big time, in Bahrain, which is why the race was cancelled. Um, I'm not sure this race will be held, by the way. Uh, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion at all, because I happen to know that several of the teams are not happy about this decision. We know that Mark Webber has said publicly that he's against it, and Rubens publicly has said that. And Damon Hill also made a statement the other day uh, saying that he felt very unsure about it. Um, so it may not happen. But the short answer, I think, Ed, is that it's not going to do Formula One any good, is it? Um, because I think Formula One will be seen to be riding roughshod over an incredibly sensitive area. Um, so I'm against it, yes, very much so. The, we've had a lot of comments on the website about it, and a lot of them have been, I live in Bahrain, there's not as big yes. a problem as everyone's saying, we want to hold the race and prove to everyone that we can hold the race and everything's yeah. fine. Yeah. And, you know, we've had very bad media coverage, yeah. give us this opportunity. I mean, what, what do you say to those Yeah, people? no, I see that point of view, which is why I was being slightly hesitant in my earlier, <coughs> excuse me, my earlier remarks, because I think it is very easy to sort of jump on band bandwagons and say this is outrageous and all this sort of thing. Which I wasn't saying before, but, and I do understand how they feel about it in Bahrain. Yes, I do, and I've been there many times myself, and uh, <clears throat> it, 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 it is not a country that you would have associated with what happened earlier this year, I must say, but it did happen. Um, I think it's a perception thing, Ed. I think that's what it is. It's the facts may be that Bahrain is now peaceful. But another fact does remain, and that is that a lot of people are oppressed in Bahrain. It's a perception thing. The outside world will look at Formula One and say, well, you know, don't you care about anything? That, that's my worry about it. I mean, we, we saw with the South African Grand Prix, you know, way back when, that, that this was a problem, and a lot of people have been drawing the comparison between the two. Do you think that's a, a fair comparison? I mean, I don't, actually. Um, I, I, I understand what you're saying, but I don't. Um, I think the reason this is very, very different is because the Arab Spring is headlines all around the world every day of the week at the moment. I mean, look at what's going on in Yemen, Syria, Libya, obviously, to a certain extent Saudi Arabia, and Bahrain. It's world news. The, the attention of the world is focused on this problem. And here comes Formula One saying, well, we're not worried about it. We're going we're gonna to hold the Grand Prix. That's what, that's what concerns me. Um, I don't live in Bahrain. I, I haven't been there this year. I don't know what the situation is. Um, but clearly, it is a part of the unrest in that part of the world. And if something did go wrong, I know it's a big if, but if something did go wrong, h how would Formula One look then? That's, that's, you know, that's my problem with it. And I, I think we'll be, we'll be watching it very closely over the, over the next few weeks. Um, but moving on, <coughs> news broken from Virgin Racing that they've parted company with Worth Research. Yeah. Um, sort of a two-pronged question here. I, when 
uh, Virgin Racing came into Formula One and they said, right, we're going to de design this car with only CFD. Yeah. Everyone said, mm, hang on a second, I don't think we're quite ready for that. Go for it, but I don't think it's going to be a success. And I went to go and interview Nick Worth. He said, yep, it's definitely going to work. And this is the end of last season. He said, yep, next year we'll be in the points and all this. Th that certainly hasn't happened. Uh, Two-part question. Was Virgin right to get rid of Worth Research? And are we ever going to see a CFD-designed car be competitive in Formula One? Were they right? Um, yes, I think you'd have to say they were right. They are right. Because uh, the car is not performing. The team is not scoring points. They've spent a lot of money. So something has to be done, doesn't it? And I guess that the most obvious thing to do was change the uh, top of the design and the engineering team. Um, people have very mixed uh, opinions about Nick Worth. Uh, I mean, I well remember the Simtech, a Formula One car he designed in the 1990s. Um, he's an interesting man, and he has interesting ideas. But it clearly isn't working very well at Virgin, whatever the reason for that is. And I personally don't know what the reason is, because it seems to me in Formula One today, the difference between uh, the car on pole and the car at the back of the grid is, you know, <laughs> they're pretty close. The middle of the grid and the front of the grid are pretty close. Um, it's just getting further up that's the really tough bit. Um, CFD, I mean, look, no one else has thought it's a good idea, have they? No. Well, I mean, I think all teams use it, but they, oh, no, always, they all, yeah, use it. all use the wind tunnel as well. And what, what I find fascinating is that, you know, with the Cure and the Worth Research Program in sports cars, yeah. it's, it's been brilliant. It's yeah. been very, very good. Yeah. And it just hasn't worked in Formula 1. I think, is that because Formula 1's just, just that little bit more technical, little, you know, you've got to try that bit harder to get the extra pace? I mean, you know, I don't want to say sports cars is uncompetitive, because you know, you've got no, no, big, sure, sure. big sort of manufacturers sure. in there, but... I, I think I think today's Formula One car, Ed, is such a complicated, such a sophisticated piece of machinery. And, you know, as I said before, the difference between getting it right and not is, is, is tiny. I mean, maybe CFD is at the root of this problem. I don't, I don't know if it is or not, but it strikes me as odd that no other team has, has relied totally on it. Yes, they all use it. You're absolutely right. Of course, yes, they do. It's a very useful tool indeed. Um, I, maybe there's something fundamentally <coughs> wrong with the Virgin car, and maybe the car has to be redesigned. But what we're asking ourselves today is, were they right to terminate the contract that they have with Worth Research? And the evidence suggests... It's, it's got to be, yes. ...suggests yeah. that, that they are right, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, the question is who's out there who's going to turn it into a winning car? Well, I think Pat Simmons has come on as a consultant. And it was interesting because he came in for an audio podcast with us a yeah. few months ago, and yeah. he said, CF, there, there will be a time when yeah, you can design yeah. an F1 car just with CFD, but yeah. it's not now. Yeah. And he's, he's very switched on and proved himself yeah. countless times of you know, making a race-winning car. Well, look, if Pat Simmons can't improve the car, then who can? I mean, Pat is a very, very clever man indeed. He's a brilliant engineer. I mean, forgetting everything else that, 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 that happened to him uh, that caused his, his sort of enforced retirement, if you like. Um, I mean, for me, it would be terrific if he does have a good effect on the car because I'd like to see Pat, you know, <laughs> rehabilitated, if you like. You know, he's a really, really good Grand Prix racing engineer. So it would be interesting to see, wouldn't it? Fingers crossed. Some other racing on the weekend, the British Touring Cars. It was certainly an exciting weekend. Uh, there was, you know, two leaders crashing into each other the last corner of the last lap with Shedden and Neil. Um, the thing that has been raised, there were a lot of penalties given over the weekend. Driving standards, uh, we're going to be doing a piece on this in the next issue. But do you think something's got to be done? Because I think this, that type of driving standard is filtering down into the lower levels of motorsport in the country. And people will watch the British Touring Car Championship, see these manoeuvres they're trying to pull off, and think, oh, well, that's, that's what you do. I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, I mean, great to be talking about racing again, <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and, and not Sorry. politics or religion or uh, uh, w whether people have got their jobs or not. Uh, look, if you did that in single-seaters, 
you would have a, a horrendous accident. That's my first point. Because they're saloon cars, they get away with it. And that's what they're doing. They're getting away with it up to a point. It's long been endemic in the British Touring Car Championship, by the way. This is absolutely nothing new. It's just that at the weekend, <laughs> uh, two teammates managed to take each other off thereby losing a huge number of points, not to mention the victory in the race. Mm. Uh, the stewards then disallowed, uh, I think it was two other overtaking moves, describing them as too robust. <laughs> too robust? I mean, look, <clears throat> we all want to see exciting racing, don't we? And this is on live television in, in the UK. So clearly, we need as good a show as possible. The television company does, the spectators do, everybody does. But when it comes to literally barging someone else off the track, well, my view is that's not good enough. Sorry. Because it's not stock car racing. It is not a contact sport, is it? Well, it, it looks like it. <coughs> and this, is, this is my point. You know, a lot of youngsters <coughs> watch this racing. And when I did the Toyota MR2 championship race at Brands Hatch, I mean, some of the driving standards were so bad. Yeah. I, mean, they were, I mean, I was on the inside of the apex at Graham Hill, and someone came down the inside and punted me out of the way. And, and then, you know, look and at it. Uh, it's, I mean, <coughs> sorry, I've got a frog in my throat today. Not good. Um, any sane person surely cannot condone cars deliberately driving into each other in a, in a top-level national championship. As I say, it is not stock car racing. It is not a contact sport. Yes, we want it to be exciting. But the biggest point of all, in my view, is if young guys do this in single-seater racing cars, they're going to get really badly hurt. Because you can't do that in single-seaters. As you, as you know, you know, they'll fly over each other. Or, or, you know, it's, it, so yes, I, I, I would like to see the stewards across motor racing being a bit tougher myself, just as I would like to see the referees in football being a bit yeah. tougher myself. As, as long as they didn't sacrifice the racing, I think, yeah, they've, they've got to be tougher. No, no. <clears throat> Sorry, no one's talking about sacrificing the racing. I think we're talking about stopping a demolition derby. Yeah. There's a hell of a difference. And dr drawing a line and keeping that line in the same place, I think. Yeah, you, you, you have to be consistent. Hmm. I mean, actually, a small point is that I reckon Formula One racing has improved quite a bit since we had really good Grand Prix drivers, ex-Grand Prix drivers, uh, joining the stewards panel. I think that's been a huge success. I think it's one of Jean Todd's sort of best best moves. Yeah, absolutely. Among many, I mean, among, among lots of good moves that Jean Todd's made. And, you know, why, why don't we do this all the way through the major national international championships? I certainly think MotoGP could do with it. <laughs> yes, so does Danny Petrosa, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah I, 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 funnily enough, actually, just to close on, 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 on two wheels, um, the tourist trophy races that are going on in the Isle of Man at the moment are absolutely gripping TV. If any of you out there can see the Isle of Man TT races on TV, you've got to watch it. I mean, this is sensational. I don't stuff. want to make you too jealous, Rob, but in, a, in about 24 hours, I'm actually leaving to go off to the Isle of Man and watch the TT races. Well, it, well, <laughs> well, it, it, well I, I am jealous. But listen, a rare occurrence at the weekend, wasn't it, that, that MotoGP was not exciting. Yeah, it very, very How about rare. that? That's so rare, isn't it? Well, that, I'm just, that's, a, that's a good thing. I like saying things like that or hearing things like that. Mm. You know, it's, it's rare that it wasn't exciting. Mm. It's, mm. You know, it's better than the other way around. Stone is looking good. Stone is looking good, isn't yeah. he, bike fans? Yeah. <laughs> on the, don't listen to Rob on any bets you're doing. I've, I've done that before and it didn't turn out very well. Martin Tomczyk took a great victory in the DTM race at Spielberg. The German has not won a race for nearly two years and led home Ralph Schumacher in second and Brit Oliver Jarvis in third. Rob Huff still comfortably leads the World Touring Car Championship, despite not coming away with a win in Hungary. Alan Menu won the first race of the weekend from pole position, while Ivan Müller took his first win of the season in race two. Um, well, Rob, thank you very much for joining me today. It's very, very kind of you. Great. You've got to go off and present our Senna evening this evening, so best of luck with that. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. It should be a great evening, and maybe you were there by the time you watched this, or when... Yeah, well, this, I think they will be. Anyway, see the film. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah. Many, many thanks for watching. We'll see you all again next week.